I'm the uh, co-director of the Mosavar Romani Center for Business and Government. Uh, this is a topic that I basically claim practically no expertise on. Um, <laughs> and so I'm very happy that we have with us today. Um, Edo Campanella has been a senior fellow and a research fellow at the center for a while. Um, Karen Dynan is a senior uh, faculty member, professor of practice here and at the uh, economics department. And um, Branko uh, Mamanovic um, is um, affiliated, I think, with, I forget which center, but the I'm sure. The, so Edda will fill you in on that, but as usual, we have a great turnout. I don't know how much, I think that's the topic, not just the food, um, <laughs> but um, anyhow, thank you for coming, and I will turn it over to Edda and Karen uh, and, and um, uh, Branko, but thank you for coming. Thanks a lot, John. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to moderate this panel on uh, one of the most consequential topics of our time, uh, both from a political and economic uh, uh, perspective. I'm glad that uh, Karen is uh, here with us in person. I'm grateful also to Branco, who had some health issues and couldn't make it in person. And um, I, I'm really also grateful that he sent few free copies of his book that are over there and will be distributed at the end of the event. Um, Branco was supposed also to present his book tomorrow at the Center for European Studies, but also that event got canceled. And uh, if you are one of the lucky ones getting a book from him, uh, you might wait a few weeks uh, to get it signed by him because he's coming back uh, to do the event uh, at the Center for European Studies uh, at some point during the semester. So um, keep track uh, of the event uh, over there. Um, <coughs> before uh, uh, we start, uh, my first uh, question would probably be to Branco. I would like to put uh, the current inequality situation into a historical perspective. This chart uh, shows the uh, global Gini index uh, since uh, the beginning of the Industrial uh, Revolution. For those of you who are not familiar with the Gini index, uh, a value close to zero is a situation of perfect inequality when it is close to one or 100, depending on how you scale it. Uh, it's a situation where basically the entire income generated by an economy is captured by a single person. You can see that uh, the Gini index globally has gone up uh, until uh, uh, the end of the uh, Cold War, and then it has declined over the last uh, 30 years, thanks to the rise of Asia and uh, uh, China in particular. Uh, but behind these apparently simple lines, many things uh, happen in terms of inequality within countries and between countries. Uh, Branco, in a recent paper, identified the three uh, eras. I would like you, Branco, uh, maybe to tell us more about the features of these three uh, eras. I remind you that you, have, uh, you are supposed to compress 200 years of world history in four or five minutes. So the the floor to, to you. Thank you, Edos. Uh, very nice to see you. Thanks a lot to Karen. Uh, my apologies for not being there. That was the original plan, but of course, sometimes plans have to change because of the external elements. Uh, I have to say that actually I can hear Edo very, very faintly. So. I'm more or less guessing what he's saying, but I hear word here and there, and I can see the slides and I know the questions. So I would actually, if you, if I say something totally off, uh, please correct me, but I think actually I so far understood the question. Uh, so the, the, uh, the slide here, as Edo said, shows different, um, uh, eras or different long episodes in the history of global inequality. I'll go relatively fast. Actually, it's a you know very, I think to some extent, un quite understandable slide. And uh, uh, the, f the first period starts from the end of the Napoleonic Wars, where we have actually the first data on global income inequality. Obviously, these data leave quite a lot to be desired. I think that the GDP per capita that we have for that period of, and for the 19th century for the major countries are generally good, but of course the distributions are much more difficult to, 
to, to actually derive. Nevertheless, I will not speak about the data underlying this, these results. They originally come from uh, Francois uh, Bourguignon and Christian Morisson, who did actually pioneering work in that area. Okay, so in any case, what you notice there is that the Gini coefficient, which is on the left, uh, was about 50 in the world, which is actually a high number for individual country, but it was not such a high number for the world. And then throughout 19th century, it went up. Now, the question is actually, why did inequality in the world go up in the 19th century? Uh, the, the answer is twofold. The first element and the most important element is that some countries, essentially Northwestern Europe, uh, North America, and later Japan, just became richer. And as you become richer, you pull most of your population towards richer levels of higher levels of income. On the other hand, India and China, and actually we don't need to go into the other countries because these two countries are so big and important, they either stagnated or in the case of China just went down. So what then happens is that you have what is of course called by the economic historians, you have the great divergence. And that great divergence is reflected in global inequality by the rising inequality between individuals. So mind you, this is not inequality between countries. It is inequality between individuals. But obviously individuals do have incomes which oftentimes reflect the incomes of their own countries. On top of that, during that period, uh, there was an increase of inequalities within nation states. Actually, for that, of course, we don't have information that is as good as for the GDP per capita, but certainly for the major developed uh, countries, advanced countries, or the countries that later became advanced countries, like the UK, France, later Germany, the US even, we actually do observe increased uh, inequality. So that was for the first period. The second period is essentially either from the end of World War I or, or World War II, because the interregnum there, the interwar period there is very short and not clear. In any case, what you notice there is that we have, the world has a very high inequality of Gini of 70. That kind of inequality does not appear in any individual country. And it is more or less stable and it is stable because within country inequalities tended to go slightly down. Uh, that was the era of the Great Compression. We know that in the United States quite clearly from the, from the end of the World War II until 1979. And then you have also some increases in inequalities between countries, but very small. And in part that increase is also an artifact because there's after colonization, decolonization, there are simply many more countries. Okay, so what happens then towards the end of the 20th century? We are talking basically 1990 approximately. And what you notice there is a sharp decline in global inequality. Now, what is driving the sharp decline in global inequality? Uh, in one word, is China. It's more complicated than China because other Asian countries later catch up as well, India, Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, Thailand, but for simplicity, because the importance of China is so huge, it was really China that actually starts driving global inequality down. And uh, it is a sort of a mirror, mirror image of what happened in the 19th century, because in the 19th century, you had one part of the world getting richer, but that part of the world was getting richer uh, and creating the great divergence. In this case, one part of the world which used to be poor, namely China, is getting richer and there is a convergence consequently. So that's where we are. As you can see there, the decline was quite significant. We are talking of more than 10 Gini points. The, the current level is about the Gini of the 60. And of course, I will continue later uh, speak about what I think might happen in the future and what even might have happened during COVID because the, the, the latest number that is here is actually 2018. So this is the basically shape of global income inequality. As you can see, it's a kind of an inverted U over the two centuries. Thank, thanks, uh, Branko. I would like to focus primarily on the current situation. I think the historical perspective is useful to see, to understand the, where we are coming from, but now I would like to zoom in, uh, zoom on the current situation. Um, 
the great uh, uh, convergence uh, was the result primarily of the drop uh, in uh, inequalities between countries. But inequalities within countries, particularly in Western countries, went up, and especially in uh, the US. This is the Gini index for the US. You see that has gone Have you finished that? since uh, uh, the, the 70s, and anything. it is much higher than uh, in uh, other countries, uh, particularly uh, Western uh, Europe. Uh, <clears throat> over the last uh, uh, 40 years, uh, uh, basically the income for the uh, working and middle classes in the US has stagnated at best, whereas it went up quite sharply for the top uh, 1%. Uh, so, in the US, uh, uh, and that's a perspective from a European, maybe I'm, I'm wrong, the way I always understood the social contract in the US is that high income inequalities were acceptable because they were compensated by high social mobility. This is no longer the case if you look at this chart that is called the Great uh, Gatsby Curve. It shows uh, on the x-axis uh, inequality, measure, measure in terms of Gini uh, index, uh, and uh, on the y-axis it shows uh, um, a measure of uh, uh, intergenerational mobility. Uh, it might be counterintuitive, but the high value on the y-axis is uh, consistent with the situation of lower social mobility, because basically that index measure how sensitive your income is uh, to the income of your parent. So a high level means that your, your income is a function of the, the income of your uh, family. And as you can see, the United States uh, is uh, in a situation uh, where uh, inequality is very high and mobility is uh, relatively low compared at least to other Western countries. So much so that some people may be pushing the argument to the extreme, say that the US is no longer a meritocracy, but is more a sort of hereditary uh, aristocracy. Um, Karen, how do you explain from an international perspective this uh, involution of the US compared to other countries, particularly Western European countries? Yeah, sure. Um, so first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. It's an honor to share a stage with, with Bronco. I'm really excited about the new book. Um, yeah, so uh, these are really striking facts, and I want to add a couple more facts to what you said. I feel like sometimes when we talk about income inequality, we get into these distracting debates where people say, oh, but I have a different measure that shows something a little bit different. Those numbers you saw about the concentration of growth at the top have recently been the source of a debate over uh, the, fa the fact that kind of a lot of that growth comes from um, – parts of income that people actually make assumptions about, that the people who compute those numbers make assumptions about, and so other people have said, oh, I make other assumptions. But just to add a couple more facts, I, I like the Congressional Budget Office numbers, which are just incredibly comp comprehensive when it comes to income, including benefits, uh, and, um, you know, both from the government and from people's employers, and it's at the household level. You can just clearly see there the limited income growth for the middle and lower part of the income distribution, and it, and it just is not as fast as the overall economy is growing. So it's got to be the income is piling up at the top. Um, I will say, if you don't want to talk about income at all, there's been a, a striking um, mirroring of growing income inequality in health outcomes. Uh, we all like to think that longevity is increasing, um, but actually, if you look at the numbers and you compare generations, it turns out all the gains have been in the top part of the income distribution. So, so my generation, you know, in my socioeconomic class, I will, they will live longer than their parents. But if you go to the bottom 40% of the income distribution, those folks aren't living longer than their parents, which I think is very striking. Um, anyway, why is this true? So I think there's some general factors and specific factors. And I would say general factors, um, limited safety net in this country relative to um, many European countries. And um, I will say that, you know, there's been a striking recent literature in economics uh, that can rigorously documents that spending money on poor children leads to better outcomes, not just in the moment, but as adults, so to speak to economic mobility. So there's this limited safety net um, and limited role for government 
generally. Like we don't have parental leave in this country. We don't have universal health care in this country. We um, fund higher ed in a way that I think is kind of nuts. I mean, we have this very costly higher education in this country. And we do give out some grants, but for there's you know a group of people whose income is not low enough for grants and they say, oh, we'll give you loans. And it's turned out a lot of those people can't pay off those loans. So then we'll say, okay, so we'll make you struggle for 10 years or 15 years, and then we'll forgive your loans, which I just think is kind of crazy. Um, so those are general factors. I, th I think there have also been specific events that have been important. So there's the China shock, which um, of course, um, researchers at the Kennedy School have been out in front kind of studying the China clock shock and, and documenting the China shock, but this is the entry of China into the World uh, Trade Organization in the early 2000s that created import competition that just kind of wiped out um, a bunch of manufacturing communities in a way uh, that just was far more permanent than we've seen in the past. And kind of they fell behind economically, and then they also had this uh, you know, all the social uh, and political dysfunction that has occurred in those communities. Uh, so that's one thing. I would say the, the financial crisis and this terrible recession we had after the financial crisis, I mean, I think sometimes we pat ourselves on the back and we say, oh, we, we recovered faster than Europe. That's a macroeconomic outcome. It took us 10 years for our labor markets to get back to normal, but there was just this tremendous scarring at the household level. So we were seeing kind of um, inclusive growth at the late, in the late 2010s before Europe was, but you know, if you looked at the level of people's wealth, it was still behind where it was two decades earlier at the end of the 20th century. Um, and I would say, you know, I would also toss on there the opioid crisis, which I think has compounded some of the poor economic outcomes that have resulted from both the China shock and the Great Recession. So, recording in progress. Th thanks, uh, and maybe one could also argue that it is possible to sustain high level of inequality and high level of uh, social mobility at early stage of economic development. Because once you get rich, uh, your social status in a way gets consolidated. It's easier for you to perpetuate privileges in favor of future generation. Uh, Branco, I, I see you are moving a little bit. I hope you, you, you fix the sound. Uh, I, do. I think you should take uh, uh, Karen's mic because I think your mic is not. Uh, uh, carrying over is it better yes a little bit better yes it's not okay. great but it's better yes okay so um, going back to your uh, uh, analysis um, one one implication of uh, the rise of asia is uh, uh, a major reshuffling in uh, individual position on uh, the um, uh, global income uh, uh, distribution. So if we look on Italy, the right uh, hand uh, chart, we see that uh, uh, basically uh, people who were at the bottom of the national distribution, the X axis, in the late uh, 80s belonged to the upper middle class globally. Now they belong barely to the middle class globally. And uh, clearly, if growth dynamics continue in this direction, in one or two decades, we can even be below. Uh, you, you can guess I'm Italian, so that's why <laughs> I'm caring a lot about this. Um, we might go below the 50% 50, 50 threshold. So, Branco, can you help us understand a little bit better what are the costs of slipping in the income in the global income distribution, and also what can be the impl what, what, what can be the implication in terms of uh, um, support for globalization in the future? Yes, thank you, Edo. So um, I'll come to that in a minute, but you don't have to worry to be Italian because that particular change is throughout. And you will see, actually, I will mention that how other countries have fared. Uh, uh, you know, this is essentially the same story that people know from the elephant chart. An elephant chart, as you remember, actually shows you that in the middle of the income distribution, global income distribution, there were significant income gains over 30 years, but in a higher part of the income distribution were essentially middle classes of the Western world are located, 
the growth rates were much smaller. Now, what did happens when it goes on like that for 30 years? Okay, let's look at the urban China first because it's kind of an obvious graph and it's not difficult to understand. The black line uh, shows you where is each urban decile in China in 1988. As you notice there, for example, the poorest people in China in urban decile in 1988, they were actually below the 20th percentile in the world. So they were very poor. The uh, top percentile, the top decile in the urban areas in China was, as you can see, at the 60, 65th percentile in the world. Okay, so that's kind of cool, but you know, 65th percentile is, is not very high. To ju just give you an idea, the median person in the Western world, the person with the median income of the Western country is at the 91st percentile. So we are talking about people who are around you and all of this, they are above 90th percentile. So a Chinese being then at the 65th is okay, but not great. But I know what happens in, the, in 30 years, obviously China goes up, the entire income distribution in China goes up because people grow by eight or 9% per year. And then of course, it's not surprising that the red line would actually be much higher. And as you notice now, the top decile of China is at the 90 plus 95th percentile in the world. So that's not surprising. It's, it's of course, uh, uh, extremely, uh, how should I say, uh, quick change given the, the, the size of the change and relatively short time period, but it's not surprising. Now, that when you look then at um, rich countries, and Italy is a good example because it's a country that has really not grown in 25 years, what then you see is that uh, the, the Chinese and other Asians who are actually doing so well are overtaking a parts of the Italian income distribution that is, you know, lower middle class or some of the middle class. In other words, they are overtaking them in their global positions. Actually, some it's easy to understand if, for example, you are at the 65th percentile and a Chinese a guy is a, a 60th, but he grows at 8% for 10 years or 20 years and you don't grow, well, he's going eventually to be ahead of you when you go down. And then you notice for Italy, this red line, uh, which is the positions in 2018, is really significantly lower than the same deciles in Italy were 30 years ago. So there is a deterioration in position. And of course, this is what I call the great reshuffling, because you, when you have the convergence of incomes, you also have reshuffling of incomes, because that convergence means that actually some people get ahead of the people who used to be um, with higher income before. Now, what is interesting, if you look at this, you know, Edo has shown Italy here, but if you look at the US, you don't have as dramatic change at the bottom, but you still have negative change in the bottom. In other words, sliding down in the distribution. You have the same thing in Germany. You have the same thing in every rich country. The interesting parts actually is like, uh, or some other countries too. Uh, we don't have the slides now, but this is in my article. Take Poland, for example. Poland, which is actually the most successful transition country and the only country in Europe that has not uh, had a negative growth rate for 30 years. What is interesting there, the bottom of the, of the, of the Polish income distribution still lost out compared to the Chinese. So they even them, they actually went down. The top of the Polish income distribution, of course, got ahead and they are much higher now than they used to be 30 years. And the same thing, actually, you can observe, for example, Brazil. Brazil is very interesting because who lost out in Brazil? As you can see in Italy, it's really the lower part of the Italian income distribution. In Brazil, it's the middle. And the logic is as follows. The poor Brazilians, they don't lose anything from China growing richer because they are anyway on the bottom of the world. So it doesn't really matter. The rich Brazilians don't lose either because the China effect is not yet strong to go actually all the way to the top. So they stay where they were on the top, but those in the middle in Mexico and Brazil lose out. So that's a basic story in ranking. Uh, whether these rankings really make a difference for an individual if he or she knows that they have declined 10%, 10 percentage points, uh, that's a different matter, and maybe we'll we'll dis discuss that later. But the reshuffling is accompanying 
uh, convergence. So in other words, convergence sounds something good, you know, the, I mean, countries that there used to be poor are now less poor, but that implies also the displacement of some people from the rich countries from the positions that they occupied before. Thanks, uh, thanks, Branko. Um, Karen, um, let's go back to the US for, for a second. Um, Biden was elected on the promise to restore the American dream, to revitalize uh, the American middle class. His presidency is coming to an end. How do you assess Maybe <laughs> his, okay, his first. Uh, I, yeah, okay. Let's say his first mandate. Uh, his first mandate uh, is coming to an end. How do we assess it uh, yeah. in this sense? Thank you. Uh, sure. Um, yeah. So um, he gets he gets credit. He's made some real progress. Um, I well, let me. The, how much credit he gets? Uh, you know, he's moved the needle, but I'm not sure we would say by a huge amount. But um, first of all, he's overseen this remarkable recovery in labor markets from the COVID recession. Uh, jobs are plentiful here in the United States right now, and I think everybody agrees on that. And, um, you know, how much he, cre he credit he gets versus other things, you know, we could debate that. But, you know, another president might have gotten in there and messed with the recovery in a way that I think could have set us back. <laughs> Um, but he also has done specific things. So he has um, um, done some things that have lowered health care costs in this country. He has um, uh, expanded Medicaid subsidies. That's health care for poor people. He has done some, some things to control um, Medicare costs, uh, health care for older people. Uh, he has um, forgiven, he's done a lot of forgiveness of student loans through various changes in that program. Um, he has passed these big, um, uh, you know, spending packages to fund uh, kind of the cre creation of manufacturing jobs in this country, but they've put on restrictions for firms that want that money, uh, that the jobs need to come with certain protections for workers and certain benefits for workers, child care, um, training, and things like that. Um, he has shown a lot of support for unions. Uh, there, it's kind of a matter of the bully pulpit. He doesn't have a lot of direct power. They've done a few small things, but he's been out there very supportive. Um, you know, that said, you know, he's only had three and a half years, not a lot of time to try to change these things. And for a significant part of that um, period, he has, um, uh, he's been working with kind of, again, strong opposition in con Congress. Now, I should say, Bidenomics is not polling well. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of people uh, who just really have been disparaging about the president's economic policies. Um, and there, I think, um, I, I think that's understandable. And I think there's been a combination of bad luck and unintended consequences of some of his policies. So bad luck. You know, so I think a you know, big story has been inflation. Turns out Americans hate inflation. And I think inflation is one of those things where everybody is affected. Everyone feels a setback from inflation. Um, and so I think that's just been hard on the way he is viewed. You know, some of that was bad luck. It was, you know, these supply chain problems that no one kind of anticipated as we opened up from COVID. But, you know, arguably it was also this gigantic fiscal stimulus that he pushed for right when he went into office. And um, I think there are a lot of people who were supportive of doing more on the fiscal front, but not, you know, just sending kind of generous checks to people who are family income of 150,000. So um, I think, you know, there were people at the time grumbling, oh, this could cause inflation. Uh, to the extent that those people offered up specific numbers, I've gone and I've looked at the data, you know, the, the hawks on inflation were saying, you know, the extreme hawks were saying 3% inflation instead of 2% inflation, not 7% inflation, which is what we actually got. And I do wonder if they had realized kind of that was a, um, you know, that was perhaps a consequence from, from, you know, loading up demand so strongly, whether they would have done something differently. And then I would say in another area, um, immigration, he ran on being pro-immigrant, and I think a lot of us support him for that. Um, but um, kind of immigration has just been, I think, much stronger than what they anticipated uh, on the order of millions of people um, coming over the border. And I think, you know, some of that's I will say luck in the sense of our economy has been so strong and they're coming from countries where the economy is not so strong. But some of that has been due to changes in policy. And I think, um, you know, there've been a lot of benefits certainly to people from that. 
but you know it's also put this strain on cities and i also think you know if you're worried about inflation a big part of that has been housing costs you know if you have several more pe million people in the country than you think uh you know that's going to that's going to put a lot of pressure on your housing market and housing costs so you know all told i think he, he has made a, a lot of progress more than i think a lot of people <laughs> thought he would but um kind of the the movement and the needle as yet has been uh limited we will talk later uh, about what to expect uh, after the November election. Before we go there, um, Branco, I would like to ask you a final question, and then we open up the debate um, about the future. Do you expect this uh, great convergence to continue, or this uh, situation can be seen as an inflection point uh, in, in a trajectory of increasing uh, uh, inequalities over time. And so we will see again uh, a, a sort of great uh, uh, divergence uh, in the future. What are your expectations in that sense? Okay, well, <clears throat> this is a very good and <clears throat> very difficult question. Let me first list things that I believe we know, and then I will list things that on which we can actually cannot make, I think, any uh, forecast. Now, the things that we know is first the China. I mean, China, which has been, of course, the engine of global inequality reduction and also global poverty reduction. Now, that engine, of course, will continue working for global poverty reduction. That's a separate issue. However, it's no longer working for global poverty reduction uh, for global inequality reduction. And I have a nice slide which actually shows you the weakening effect of China. Now, the reason is not. Chinese growth rate being now lower than it used to be. The reason China has actually moved uh, over the point, the median income Chinese is over the median income global person. So in other words, China has moved to the range what the World Bank calls uh, uh, upper middle income countries. And as it moves there, in uh, faster growth of China, of course, reduces the differential difference between China and the US, but increases the differences between China and Bangladesh and uh, Congo and uh, Sudan and Ethiopia and so forth. So then China is currently a neutral to slightly adding to global inequality. So that's something that we know. So we cannot count on the engine of China anymore to drive global inequality down. So that part is over. So then who on whom can we count? Obviously, India, who is actually which is actually much poorer than China, could be the next engine. And India is growing reasonably fast over the last 20 years. You know, there are individual years, including the COVID years, where actually 2020 when India had a dramatic decline, but then we recovered the next day, the next year. So India is could potentially take the role of China. Uh, there is also Bangladesh, for example, when we talk about uh, uh, Asia, there is also Vietnam. But the main role really has to be played by African countries. And this is something that has not been kind of seen in this sort of a general narrative that focuses on China. But Africa has not been converging. Actually, for Africa had declined. Africa continued to decline. And Africa had very few countries of any size. The only exception is Ethiopia, which had a significant rate of growth for a uh, you know, reasonable period. It's actually in the case of uh, Ethiopia for 13 years. So the question is, can Africa really grow at the rate which would be at least 5% African countries, large African countries, can they grow at the rate of at least 5% per year for a period of 10 years, I'd say. If they do, then we would, of course, continue with global inequality reduction, and we would actually have Africa become a much richer continent compared to the rest of the world than we have now. But as I said, this is a big question mark. We don't know if it will happen. And then I go to the, to the elements that we cannot forecast, and they do have impact on Africa as well. The first one is really climate change. We know the climate change is going to affect poorer countries more negatively. And I think 
according to what I've read, I'm not an expert on that, but Africa and African countries would be really affected badly by climate change. So on top of other handicaps that Africa faces, there is this climate change problem. And then we have basically two big international issues, uh, both of which are almost certain to have negative in impact both on global poverty and global inequality. The one is the war between Russia and Ukraine, which, as you know, first is unpredictable. It's over term, over long. I mean, all, if it's act, that war can actually escalate to everything, including nuclear war. Uh, but as it, it is now, we, of course, had increase in the prices of, of oil. We had really reorganization of an economy, Russian economy, basically. <clears throat> and we had, of course, the increase in price of uh, of different grains, which of course uh, hurts the poor people the most, because if you take energy and grains for poor people, that represents 80% of their consumption. So that's a big one. The second big one is US-China. Uh, that's also unpredictable. Not only the wars, but really whether the trade relations would deteriorate, what would happen, what would be, uh, how the, the ships will go from one place to another. Karen mentioned, of course, the, the issue of supply chains, but now we have new issues of supply chains, which have nothing to do with COVID. Now we have the war in Israel and Gaza, and then you have the ships that cannot go through the Red Sea. So we are really in a situation that is absolutely impossible to predict. I mean, for people like me, because the, the, the crucial factors there are clearly political and we cannot predict political factors. So I, I what I would say then, uh, if you take the first part of my presentation I mean, on this question, I would say uh, we, we need to do a lot and well, Africa needs to do a lot in order to really try to catch up maybe Africa would be the Asia of the 21st century. On the second part, I really, I think we need to take into account political uncertainties. And as economists, there is absolutely nothing that I think we can do there. Thanks, uh, thanks, Branko. Maybe we can see what uh, the US uh, can uh, do to give its contribution to a continued decline in global uh, inequality. Um, support for equality of opportunity should be a non-partisan issue, but given the degree of polarization, the political polarization that characterizes the U.S. today, this is probably not the case. Regardless, uh, and maybe regardless is uh, a big uh, word in this case, but regardless of who wins, um, what are the set of policies that you think both the Republicans and the Democrats could uh, agree <laughs> upon in order to boost social mobility or to de decrease uh, income inequality, if any? It's really hard. I mean, um, you know, it's funny. I at some point in my career in Washington, I was at the Brookings Institution for a few years, and I felt like we had no end of bipartisan panels where everyone came in, was supposed to be very fielded, and agreed that we need to do something about education. Like, everyone should agree that we need to provide better education to our children. But then you get down into the kind of the specifics, and they, they don't agree. I mean, the, the Democrats are much more likely to think, um, you know, what we need to do is put more money towards the problem, and the and people who are conservative, Republicans are likely to say, no, 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 it's about reforming the school system. Um, probably both are right to some degree, uh, but it's just it's just tough on an issue like that where people, everyone agrees something needs to be done on that specific issue, but they just can't agree on what. Um, I guess there are a couple of bright spots in my view, and one has to do with evidence-based policymaking. Um, it's a big, big deal in the economics literature over the last 15 years that we um, have um, presented all this rigorous evidence that certain interventions, particularly spending money on poor children and their families, um, they pay, they really pay off in terms of mo mobility. I mean, it's just amazing. I mean, it helps these kids in the moment, uh, prevents hardship in the moment, but then, you know, we look 20 years down the road and they're kind of earning more income and they're less engaged with the criminal justice uh, system. They've gotten more education. They're more likely to participate in the labor force. And um, 
you know, that evidence has been great. And I, I saw a real bi bipartisan appeal that you really can say to someone who is conservative, fiscally conservative, you know what, uh, you know, we got to spend money on this thing, but we will get a return from that. I think they feel much better about that. The, the problem there is we just don't have enough. Um, we're getting more. I mean, thanks to the fact that we have longer data sets and we have big data now to work with. Um, but, you know, uh, this Build Back Better uh, package that the Biden administration uh, pushed earlier on and it failed, and it was hundreds of billions of dollars for preschool education. And, you know, it's one thing to say we have special, we have studies showing that in special places we can have special programs that will yield these really high returns. But it's another thing to say, oh, you know, what do we do with hundreds of billions of dollars? Um, but I do, but I do feel like we're going to get more of this kind of evidence. I do think that will help. I would say the other bright spot um, is uh, kind of anti-competitive behaviors, um, addressing kind of obstacles that are really not fair market outcomes. So uh, this is something my team worked on uh, when I was at the Treasury Department. For example, occupational licensing and non-compete agreements. Uh, you know, real barriers to entry for workers as a result of kind of what's been over-regulation in this country. You know, 25% of our jobs are now uh, covered by occupational licensing. And of course, you want your brain surgeon to be licensed. But, you know, it has spread into, um, uh, you know, professions where it's just really the logic is unclear, um, like, you know, uh, interior design uh, and things like that. Um, and so it's just been a kind of, you know, it, it's, it's ripe for reform. And we, real, so we saw real bipartisan interest there. Non-competes, similarly, you know, why do we have people who work uh, for, sam for sandwich shops? Why, you know, Amazon for a while had a non-compete. I mean, imagine that. I mean, what, what, are the, what are we gaining out of that except just kind of creating obstacles for worker mobility? So there's, I saw a lot of bipartisan interest there. I would love to say, um, housing as well, you know, because housing is such a problem in this country, the cost of housing. And we know a big part of the problem is just we have uh, you know, too many um, zoning regulations that prevent high density building. And uh, it's just kind of been hard to get action on that front. But I would love to think that that's another area that we can both come, uh, come together on. And it, and it doesn't cost money, which is great, too. Um, so, so I do think... Um, you know, these areas are there, but uh, I don't have kind of the magic big solution. Yeah. Thanks, thanks. So maybe it's now time uh, to, any time for questions from the audience. Uh, so we have the mic coming. Good if you can introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Eric Milans from the sociology department at Fairfield University. Um, I was wondering <clears throat> if you could comment about the political consequences of all of this because uh, to what to some degree one could argue from a sociological point of view that um, income inequality within the United States <coughs> and the reduction that has increased and the reduction of in, um, global uh, income inequality which you've described these are ultimately political decisions right I mean whether it's about the Reagan revolution and the end of the Keynesian consensus the tax cuts in the Reagan era the continuing tax cuts under the Bush uh, junior administration, the tax cuts of the Trump administration, um, and, and as well as, you know, the NAFTA implementation in 1994, and then, of course, uh, China being allowed to join the WTO about 20 years ago. All of these are political decisions, right, uh, that allow uh, this, this temporary moment to occur in which China uh, experiences economic growth, at the expense, one could add, of millions of manufacturing jobs within, uh, you know, the, the United States. Uh, think of Detroit, Michigan, or the rural area in Germany, the Randstad in the Netherlands, right? Uh, Liverpool, Manchester, UK, and so forth. So <clears throat> my question is the following. Giving the political pushback uh, to this reality uh, within, within the Western world, if you will, uh, as you described what happened to, to Italy, right? Uh, in, in particular, um, it seems to me that it's unlikely to count on further free trade agreements with India or Africa in the years to come, right, to reduce global inequality. I mean, I can tell my European friends, yes, it's true, uh, you've suffered uh, 
in terms of uh, decline of purchasing power over several decades now, as you know, uh, your wages has not come go, go up uh, to, like they did traditionally in the first 30 years of the Trente Glorieuse uh, after 1945 re reconstruction, as they've gone up with productivity and profits and so forth. This 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 has stopped. But you know, the Chinese have been doing well, and other poor yeah, people doing well. So 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 yeah. where, where, where if, if the political backlash continues, right? In the West, which I'm seeing in Italy, which I'm seeing in other places, where is the, um, the economic growth going to come from that will reduce global inequality in, in the non-West? How is the, Because if it's not coming from economic growth, the only other option is redistribution, no? Thanks. Branko, could, could you hear the question? We can't hear you. We can't. You should unmute yourself. <coughs> Okay, let me try just to, it's, it's a very complex question, so it's really probably would require a very long uh, sort of peroration on this, but let me try to, to start to simplify. Short, First actually. of all, the graph that I've shown you for Italy, it is true that in Italian case, the bottom probably lost even in real terms because Italy did not grow. But, you know, the... the uh, positional loss does not imply that your real income necessarily is lower. It simply implies that at that part of the global income distribution, you may be growing 2% per annum, and Bangladesh or China or India may be draw drawing 6%. So it's not the saying that if your relative position in the world goes down, that you actually are poorer. You may be poor, depending on the situation, or you may be actually better off, but your grow, rate of growth was not the same as the rate of growth of an equivalent Chinese. So let me clarify that. Uh, the second issue then, of course, is a difficult issue. If one has a, how should I say, cosmopolitan point of view, actually the gains of Chinese who are poorer than the Europeans are a good thing. So it's actually saying, for example, within the United States, well, I really don't like African-Americans to gain because if they gain a job, then somebody else who is actually richer than them is going to lose. So that's from the global point of view, it's actually a non-starter, okay. But from the political point of view of individual country, yes, I agree, it can become a starter. And you say, well, we don't like this kind of a globalization that we are not going to be in the top quintile anymore. And the fact is that according to the data that we have going back to the beginning of the 19th century, essentially Western Europeans were always practically in the uh, top quintile of the world. And that is not going to be the case uh, if the current situation continues. Uh, so yes, I, I understand that it could be politically an issue, but we have to distinguish what is an issue politically for individual country and what is globally, I think, a good thing. So that's the, these two things are, as I said, it seems to me are different. Yeah, I don't know if you, Karen, you want to elaborate on this. I'll just say one or two things. And, and one is, I think you're entirely right, the politics matter. I think, you know, in this country, um, kind of this, all these economic outcomes we've been talking about have, have had very troubling political consequences, which I'm sure you would agree with. I mean, it's created this sense among a, a large share of our population um, that the system is rigged, that we can't trust experts. Uh, it's fostered the rise of, of populism and, and policies that really aren't good for either the economy or for individuals. Um, and I think some of that, as Bronco was saying, I think some of that is is real. You know, when a country, our country did lose, parts of our country did lose out when um, kind of we, China entered the WTO. Uh, but, you know, I think there's also, uh, you know, s some of it's kind of just a misunderstanding. So, for example, we think all these jobs have been lost to competition from foreigners, but actually kind of a huge share of it has been technology, right? And what I want to just say there is I think leaders need to have, uh, we know that what leaders say, their rhetoric matters. We can see that in opinion polling. We saw like, you know, support for immigration amongst Republicans just seriously kind of moved very sharply against immigration when, when President Trump came into office. And it was just his his rhetoric around it. And so I think, you know, it really matters how, how leaders are thinking about these things and expressing themselves. And 
kind of they in my view they should be talking more about kind of the benefits of having more inequality more equality across the globe thanks a lot and probably if i may i, I think there is a, a parallel now with india uh, compared to what happened in the back in the late 90s with china because i see a lot of international support for a further integration of the Indian economy into the, the global economy. So maybe that could be a source of uh, uh, growth that can lead to a further compression in global inequality. I think there are a few questions, one here, one there. Maybe we can take them together. I kindly ask in the interest of the time to be concise. Thanks. So two quick questions about your reversal of fortunes graph. Um, does Do things look different if you kind of pool urban and rural China and then compare to say all of Italy or the US? The reason I ask is I'm wondering if the kind of growth in Asia in that final period was different in that the growth in China has also pulled rural areas along um, as opposed to what happened in the Western countries. So that's one. The second, when you're comparing 1988 and 2018, was it? How are you thinking about migration? What does it mean? Because with a lot of migration, it seems like there's more externalities with China growing uh, on the US and vice versa. So how do you kind of account for that? And we have another question over there. Yeah, mine is very specific, which is none of you have raised the question of transferring wealth from the wealthiest to the rest of the society. You haven't talked about tax policy that would shift the slope of progressivity. You haven't talked about taxing labor at a lower rate than capital when we do just the opposite. You haven't talked about expansion of IRS uh, enforcement of tax rules uh, or a, a minimum global corporate tax. Uh, and I think that to not open the students up to the possibilities that all those represent is a real mistake for a school like the Kennedy School. And I love the Kennedy School. Thanks. Branko, do you want to respond to the first question? I, I could not hear all the questions. I understood one question, which was on migration. Uh, you know, technically, I uh, in the work that I do, I just take the population as it is. Uh, some people have looked whether the same results would uh, uh, hold if you take the population in the original year. Uh, and basically they do. So, you know, migration has not played, I mean, the changes in population have not played a great role. Now, I believe that the gaps in income between the countries do fuel migration. So in that sense, migration is an outcome of large differences in between country incomes. Uh, and I think this is a most notable in the case of Africa and Europe, because Africa, of course, is the only continent that will grow in the 21st century in terms of population. Europe is a continent that is shrinking and uh, the resistance to further immigration from Africa and the Middle East is quite strong. So I think they, this is where, in my opinion, the, the major issue will be, especially when I mentioned before the importance of Africa for global income. Um, uh, in a, a global income equality. So I see really Africa versus Europe more of an issue in the 21st century than the US migration, which uh, the problem there has been for a long time. And uh, also the US was generally able to absorb quite a, quite a lot of people. You, for Europe, it's a new phenomenon. Europeans were exporters of people for several centuries, actually since since 15th century, they just exported people. And now for the first time, they actually have to import people. So that's a big change. So Brank, I think the first question, if I got it right, uh, is about China and whether the China story changes if instead of focusing on urban, uh, the urban population, you also take, take into account the rural one. No, uh, the Ch China story is is holding for both. But the reason why I took urban, well, there are two reasons. First, Chinese surveys is a technical reason. But the Chinese surveys are divided into rural surveys and urban surveys. Uh, so for some years, you don't have China as a whole, as a country with detail, okay? 
but the second thing is because, of course, the, the ch changes are more dramatic with urban China simply because it is richer and it moves into the income distribution of Western countries. Obviously, rural China is still relatively poor. It does not really move into the income distribution of Italy. You know, so that, that's the reason why I took uh, urban China. Okay, thanks. And maybe Karen, do you want to react? To yeah, I'll question? take it. Yeah, no, I know that was an excellent point. Uh, what I can say in this country is that it became very fashionable in the 2010s to talk about pre-distribution of income, not redistribution. So, that's, so hence all the talk about, oh, education and let's reform occupational licensing and, and uh, increase the minimum wage. I think, you know, the redistribution, oh, it is really, really important. I think Part of the reason you don't hear as many people go there is that it's so politically difficult. It's so politically difficult to do anything with taxes. Um, but in general, kind of no one, uh, you know, no one wants to see taxes go up. And we've seen actually these promises, right? I mean, we've seen promises by the Republicans that they're going to raise any taxes. And we've seen promises by the Democrats that they're not going to raise any taxes except for on the very top of the income distribution, um, which I think is a real mistake. And it puts us in a real jam for and there's two reasons it's going to really hit us hard in coming years. And one is um, just the fiscal, this is the United States story, the fiscal problems we're facing. I mean, we have to make kind of big changes in the way we tax and spend in this country to fix um, the fact that our, our, uh, our debt is about to kind of soar to unprecedented levels, which just can't work out well for our country. Um, so that, that conversation has to uh, involve redistribution. The other thing which we haven't talked about at all, and this is more speculative, is AI. Like, so people are saying, oh, AI, you know, there's the optimist story that we're going to see all this productivity growth and that's going to fix all of our problems, income problems, it's going to fix our budget problems. But I don't, the, uh, you know, when I see these numbers from the, the people who are really bullish on AI, I don't know how we get that without massive displacement. I mean, some of it's going to be like AI is just good for everyone. It generates new ideas for jobs, but some of it's just going to be it takes a bunch of jobs. And, uh, you know, if those predictions come to bear, I think, you know, we're going to have to have a much bigger conversation around redistribution, not just within the United States, but then it becomes global too, because it depends on who owns the robots, right? I mean, it depends who owns the AI. If it starts disp displacing people kind of on a wide scale basis in countries like China, India, Africa, uh, and then all the capital is actually owned by people in this country, kind of, you know, what do you do then? You know, then you have to talk about global redistribution. So. Thanks. And maybe an interesting panel could be on how to create a, a human compatible AI or human augmented AI. But that's for another day. <laughs> uh, I think there is a question here. Any other question in, in the audience? Yeah, maybe this one. Uh, My question was like, uh, since like in every country, India is also facing jobless growth. Like there's a whole discussion about it. India is growing, but it is not creating that much employment. And the whole world migration, like free trade agreement would help in that sense that countries should grow at their own rate. And then that would be sufficient to provide the growth. But about the uh, question raised about tax. So is like public policy schools doing uh, like, a good job in promoting that, like global wealth tax, where like in every country there, the inequality is very skewed, like in India also, I see. So is, are we promoting those kind of policies through research that yes, wealth tax is needed and how much we are pushing it as a policy school? Uh, Branko, do you want to, to react? I would be very brief. I think Karen should react. She knows much more. But I think there is no such a thing as actually, I mean, it's very difficult. I mean, a global wealth tax, it, it's not, uh, you know, we are talking about in uh, countries taxing wealth and debt itself is difficult. And as you know, many countries have abolished inheritance taxation or made it very small. Uh, so, you know, it, it's a it's a nice idea, honestly, but to see the global wealth tax, I just don't see that happening. Karen? Um, yeah, I'm similarly uh, pessimistic as Bronco is. Um, without some um, 
and a huge disruption that then makes the costs of these, you know, big disparities in income much more salient to kind of the average person in a rich country, um, which I think is unfortunate. Um, but yeah, I think uh, so. So I'm not a public finance person, but we have we have a lot of uh, public finance experts here at the Kennedy School who are teaching uh, kind of you know. Uh, students, how, you know, how to think about taxes, but it's uh, it's just tough to do anything on a global basis. That that actually that's interesting. I mean, that's like one of the the great things about the Kennedy School is that it's not just economics, right? That you're talking about here. I mean, here you're talking about something that's much more multidisciplinary. And this is one reason I like being at the Kennedy School because I don't think these solutions get worked out without understanding many more fields than just economics. Yeah, and if I may, <clears throat> I think. Uh, a global wealth tax is probably political, politically non-viable. I think it would be already some progress uh, if we could uh, uh, address the problem of uh, global tax haven, and that could be yeah. already a good step uh, in, in the right direction. But even that <coughs> is politically challenging. John, you wanted to ask No, I was just, I'm going to come at your question from a slightly different perspective, and that is, um, an institutional versus a faculty perspective, just to kind of help you understand how research is done. The Kennedy School doesn't have an opinion about anything, really. Um, individual faculty members have opinions about everything, um, right? And that's their role, that's their job, is to have that perspective. And there are a number of faculty working on taxation issues and what those should look like. Um, but you won't see an institutional room. You won't see the Kennedy School coming out and saying, this is great or this is horrible. Right? That's, that's not our job. We're supposed to provide the forum in which those issues can be debated and discussed. Um, I think, for example, the global taxation issue, I mean, I think the Biden administration did push to try to get a minimum corporate tax uh, kind of structure on a global basis so that you don't have forum shopping and businesses migrating to find the lowest common uh, tax, mm. best tax rate for them. So you see those kinds of activities um, and some faculty members here um, spoke out very aggressively uh, in support of that, one of them being my co-director of the center, Larry Summers, who seems to do, do, does have an opinion about everything um, <laughs> and is not, sh not shy about sharing. Um, but that, uh, it's more of just an institutional comment on, on how research happens at a, at a place like Kennedy School. So I think Karen has to go. Uh, before we uh, hand out the copies of Branko's book, uh, I want to give Branko the opportunity to summarize uh, the key insights of his book uh, that is basically an intellectual history of inequalities since the French Revolution. He talks about some of the key economic thinkers uh, of, uh, of the last three centuries, including uh, Marx and Smith. But in the interest of time, because then students need to go to classes, I don't know if, Branko, you can just give us a, a quick sense of the book. Well, I cannot, I mean, if you give me two minutes, I can just tell what the book is about. Yeah. Okay. So the book is really a history of thought book. The objective was the following. Uh, let us look how most important economists thought, or actually how can we interpret their thinking about income, mostly income, but also somewhat wealth inequality. The economists included are Francois Kenet, who actually was the first to introduce social classes. Then I continue this predictable order. Adam Smith, I would actually urge people to read the chapter of Smith, which I think my take is very different from Marmartia Sen. Uh, I think that basically Smith is a left-wing economist, okay? Let's put it like that. Mm -hmm. Then David Ricardo, then Marx, which has a very long chapter and where I actually argue that Marx did not have what is generally imputed to him to have the immiseration theory. That's one of possibilities, but he never came to a definite theory about income distribution in advanced capitalism. Then Pareto, who is interesting for us because he had this idea of the elites. And nowadays, basically, we speak of the elites because 1% is basically an elite. Uh, then Simon Kuznets, who is quite well known, and, and you know, I don't need to say much more about that, him. 
And then I actually have the last chapter where there is no single individual, but as the period from 1970 to 1990, I end up with the end of the Cold War. I didn't go to go into the present with the exception of a short uh, sort of epilogue. Uh, so that's basically 200 years of thinking by the most important economists of their thinking about income distribution. So that's what the book is about. Thanks, Branko. I thought you were about to say that Marx was a right-wing thinker, but uh, <laughs> that's, that's probably not the case. I'm saying that Marx was what? That, that Marx was a right-wing thinker. Ah, uh, no, no, I didn't say that. I just think that Adam Smith is a left-wing. Okay. So thanks a lot, Branko. Even if it was uh, virtual, it was a pleasure to have you with us. It was a very fascinating conversation. Karen, the same. It was uh, great uh, to talk to you. And I want to thank all the people who show up today in person and uh, virtually. And once we close uh, the, the call, then we distribute the, the books. So thanks, everyone, and have a nice rest of the day. Bye.